Welcome to Establish the Edge. I'm your host, Mike Leone, back with another solo podcast. Today, I'm going to look at the zero running back strategy or wide receiver early heavy drafting and why it works, where you may implement it, and also recap the main event team that Adam Levitan, Evan Silva, and I recently completed, which was pretty entertaining, but I think there are some legitimate draft strategy takeaways from that. But before we get into all of that, I do want to note that this pro- podcast is brought to you by Underdog Fantasy. Right now, their Best Ball Mania 3 contest is running, and that tournament has $2 million to first place in the playoffs, $1 million to second place, $1 million to the regular season point leader. So three different cracks that went in a million dollars there. And not only that, but it's a great way to prepare for your home league drafts or any other managed league drafts you may have coming up. So definitely check that out. If you use promo code ETR when you sign up, they will match your first deposit up to $100. Again, use promo code ETR up to $100 in free entries. Okay, let's get into the zero running back strategy. I want to talk about it because we did this main event draft earlier this week, and we did not take a running back out of the nine spot in the draft until round nine. Um, We drafted the rest of our starting lineup and even some bench wide receivers before we took a running back. And when we stream these types of drafts, we get two types of responses. There are people who are really into it and think your team's amazing. And there are people who think you're an absolute idiot for ignoring the running back position. They just can't comprehend why you would do that. So I want to talk today a little bit about why you would actually do that and what kind of went into our thought thought process. So first outlining zero RB in general, and then switching up gears and specifically recapping our FFPC team. For zero RB in general, if you're going zero RB or wide receiver heavy drafting early, format matters first and foremost. Leagues that it's good to try this strategy in or some variation of it, you know, hero RB where you take one running back early and don't draft one for a while is really viable as well. You want to try this in leagues that are full PPR. Half PPR is fine, but full PPR is definitely better um, because of the for two reasons. One, it helps the wide receiver advantage that you're going to build up in the draft. And two, it gives you some more startable running back options that you can get later in the draft because you can use pure pass catcher like a JD McKissick type with low draft capital and give you a decent base level of points before hopefully you cash in on some running back lottery tickets. You would prefer these to be leagues where you start three wide receivers and a flex. Leagues like FFPC are fine too, that are two wide receivers and two flexes that give you the ability to start four wide receivers in total. And also leagues where end of season upside is more important, which quite frankly is the vast majority of leagues. In the main event draft we just did, it's a really top heavy playoff tournament. Weeks 15 to 17 are so, so important. Obviously you have to get there, but you want to construct the type of team that could win when you get there. But any league, even your home league that has playoffs, you want your team to have, you want to have a super team entering the playoffs that has a really good chance of winning. Leagues where it's worse to try this in, standard scoring, of course, because the reliance on touchdowns is a lot heavier and running backs are better bets to score touchdowns across the board. Leagues where you only start two wide receivers and maybe one flex. So it's a min two wide receiver, max three wide receiver format. We want to be a lot more careful about wide receiver, early heavy drafting in those formats. It doesn't mean we can't utilize it, but we don't need the depth early that we do in full PPR leagues where we can start four wide receivers. So why in any format would you try this? It starts out with the fact that running backs early simply aren't great picks for the most parts. And this is for a few reasons. One, injury rates are higher at the running back position. Than there are other positions. So the bust rate's higher. Bust rate is also higher because it's a real volume dependent position. And a lot of the running backs that get drafted early are getting drafted based on their workload starting in the beginning of the year. That may not necessarily lead to the same workload as the season progresses and the end of the year. And what's really important in PPR leagues, wide receivers are outscoring running backs at almost every point during the draft. There are some exceptions like the very top of the draft where you get a running back when the elite ceiling like CMC. So if we are taking running backs early, we want a really elite ceiling because basically 
if you look at ADP at every point throughout the draft, your scoring expectation is higher for taking a wide receiver than a running back. And we want to score the most points possible. So we should be taking wide receivers. Couple this with the fact that running back is a position that you can get lucky at. It's a volume dependent position. So players that maybe aren't as talented or are talented on the bench, if they step into a role, they can go from complete zeros to league winners quickly. For example, if Leonard Fournette goes down for Tampa Bay, Rashad White could deliver fantasy value akin to a round one or round two pick. Like the upside is that high because the high value touches that offense provides. And that's not really the same at other positions. You know, uh, if you see Kyle Pitts go down in Atlanta, the backup tight end in Atlanta doesn't become a top four round pick like Kyle Pitts is. Uh, so you kind of get how that works. And on top of that, we have the waiver wire in managed league. So it's not just one bet we're looking at. You know, if we're taking Rashad White, for example, we're not just betting on Rashad White. We're loading up our bench with a lot of running back bets. We're going to churn through these bets over the course of the season based on how depth charts are shaking out, how running back efficiency is playing out. So while we might start with six, seven, eight bets at our draft at running back, we're going to maybe touch 30 running backs over the course of the season. And we just need one or two of those to hit in a really big way. It also allows you to mix startability. Again, full PPR guys like Naheem Hines, JD McKissick with guys that have pure upside, Rashad White, Isaiah Spiller, Kenneth Walker, those types. And we really maximize the dynamic and the leverage of our teams if when we get really lucky at the running back position, we're able to fill one of our two running back spots immediately there and get that production without having invested capital at running back. If you draft multiple running backs early and you get really lucky on Rashad White, that's not going to be as impactful because you've already spent a lot of capital at the position and you may just have the position blocked and you might not be able to start Rashad White uh, or maybe you can in the flex and that works. And I'm just using Rashad White as an example here. I'm not saying you like you have to absolutely draft this guy in every draft, but just, you know, insert late round running back that hits there. So you really do, again, maximize the dynamic by not having these types of seasons blocked from getting into your lineup and by not spending early capital at the draft back at, at, at the running back position. As far as wide receiver value, as I said earlier, wide receivers are outscoring running backs at most points during the draft. And with each pick, given the chaos of an NFL season, we want to ask ourselves, what's the best pick here? You know, we don't want to necessarily look at it. What do we need to fill out our lineup day one, we want to look at who is the best pick and it's the guys that are scoring the most points, but we're getting off track here a little bit. The point is if you take wide receivers early and often you beat people in the wide receiver, one spot, you beat them in the wide receiver, two spot, you kill them in the wide receiver, three spot. If they haven't been drafting lots of wide receivers early and you absolutely bury them in the flex spot because wide receivers are scoring more points than running back in full PPR leagues. And one of the mistakes people make is they go, oh, but you're really weak at running back. Well, your RB1 spot isn't worth more points than your fourth wide receiver spot, aka your flex spot. You don't get 2x the amount of points for your RB1 spot. It's the same. So it's okay for your RB1 and RB2 spots to be the lowest scoring positions in your lineup. You don't get an award for having a balanced lineup. And to accomplish this beating people at wide receiver one, two, three, and in the flex, we need to take more wide receivers than there are starting spots. They're going to be bye weeks. They're going to be injuries. Some of your guys are going to bust. Some of the guys that you take later could break out in a big way. So if we take six wide receivers in the first eight rounds, for example, that gives us four startable ones from day one, but then it also gives us a couple of cracks at guys breaking out or to cover some of the first four wide receivers having bye weeks or having injuries or simply not having the types of seasons that we expected. And there's a real mental hurdle for people to get over that aspect of, okay, you drafted your four starting wide receivers. I get it. Wide receiver early makes sense, but why not go and fill your running back spots? And this is where you really have to 
focus on the fact that you're not trying to optimize your day one starting lineup. You want your team to be optimized towards the end of the season. You want to be fine day one. We want to be optimized towards the end of the season. So many things are going to happen in so many unpredictable ways that taking a worse pick in a vacuum, which oftentimes is the running back in round six over the wide receiver in round six, just to say you fill out your starting lineup is really short-sighted and a bad idea. The other advantage to not drafting running backs early is there's more room for detours and grabbing elite onesies. When I say onesies, I mean the quarterback position or the tight end position where you're only starting one guy. And this is the inverse of running back in a lot of ways. It's very difficult to match the upside of an elite tight end by getting lucky late in your draft. There aren't a ton of tight end breakout profiles. Even if there are, they need to be in the right environment to have a huge season. So someone who has a Travis Kelsey, a Kyle Pitts, a Mark Andrews, maybe even a Waller or a Kittle, they have a built-in advantage at tight end that's going to be really hard for you to make up at tight end. It's possible for you to make it up by beating them elsewhere, but if we take an elite onesie, we take a bunch of breakout wide receivers, we could get lucky at running back, as noted. We could beat our opponents everywhere, and that's the goal, to build a super team where you're just in such a dominant position over your opponents come the end of the season. Okay, so that was the quick zero RB recap. There are, of course, a bunch of caveats, but I wanted to outline the main components of why I think it is a viable strategy and it makes more sense than it probably looks like on paper if you're just looking at someone's draft and looking at their week one starting lineup. So let's segue to the FFPC draft that Evan, Adam, and I did the other night. If you are watching on the Established Run YouTube channel, please like, subscribe us. That helps a lot, but you also get a view of our draft board. We had the ninth spot overall. We took Stefan Diggs with our first pick. Dalvin Cook went in front of us. Would have been a real decision point if we wanted to go Hero RB with Dalvin Cook. We still could have done that and taken DeAndre Swift or... Um, I think it, it probably would have been Swift or Barkley would have been the, the really high ceiling running backs we would have taken if we went running back there. And honestly, in hindsight, I think that might've been a good idea because this ended up being a real running back heavy room, which opened up wide receiver values late. But the issue with that is we don't know ahead of time what type of room it's going to be. And quite frankly, I would much rather be squeezed out of running back and a running back heavy room then I would like to be squeezed out of wide receiver in a wide receiver heavy room. Second round for us, tight end premium tournament type setting. We're smashing Mark Andrews or Kyle Pitts every time because I think, again, you need that type of upside at the tight end position come the playoff weeks because you can't manufacture it late. As we've noted, you can manufacture the upside late at running back to wide receiver as much. I like hitting wide receiver early. You can do that to an extent really difficult to do it at tight end. Then we go to rounds three and four, and it's been a running back heavy room. So pretty obvious situation for us to start stockpiling wide receivers. We went DJ Moore and Cortland Sutton. I prefer Jalen Waddle to Sutton, but we're splitting hairs. You know, systemically there, there's two breakout type of wide receivers that we want to target. If we were to take a running back in round four, there were two options for us, J.K. Dobbins, or Brees Hall, younger, higher upside type backs. That's the bet we kind of want to make. Uh, I think the wide receiver tier was too good, though, to pass on. If Dobbins or Hall came back to us in round five, super easy selection. But they don't come back to us in round five. And we see a similar dynamic really at each pick, five rounds five through round eight which is basically, yes, we could take a running back to fill out our starting lineup, but in a vacuum, the running back is a worse pick than the wide receiver at each point in the draft. And it's too early and too important of draft capital be to spending it on a worse player just for the sake of filling out the starting lineup. 
So round five, I think we should have taken Amon Ross St. Brown or Chris Godwin and really hammered home our wide receiver advantage. Clear tier drop off after those two guys. We did opt for the stack on a tournament setting, taking Lamar Jackson to pair with Mark Andrews. Unfortunately, Amon Ra and Chris Godwin both go before it comes back. This was the toughest pick in the draft for us where, again, I don't think there was a running back worth taking here, possibly David Montgomery, but we don't even have our four wide receivers yet, and we want more than that coming out of the first eight rounds to really crush people in the two wide receiver spots and the two flex spots. So we go with Michael Thomas, who has some really high catch volume upside but a lot of uncertainty. So if we were to do this again, definitely would have taken Amon Ra or Chris Godwin. Hoped that Lamar came back in six, taking Lamar if he, if he came back in six. If not, you know, there's some late quarterback values, Kyler, Jalen Hurts, Trey Lance, Tom Brady, that we could have waited on and figured out quarterback and still got in a top 10 type of quarterback in this format. So I think that was a mistake that we made. Round seven, eight, though, a lot of you know the guys that we'd consider taking there went. In particular, Elijah Mitchell, Tony Pollard went before our pick there. We could have in round seven gone with Chase Edmonds, Miles Sanders, or Damian Pierce. I think those were all options that were defensible, especially understanding that we we're in a running back heavy room and we, we could take some wide receiver upside shots later would have made us a little bit safer at the running back position. But there were two big breakout profiles we still wanted to target to get our six wide receivers through round eight. So we take Kadarius, Tony. Then those running backs all go anyways before our eighth pick. And we take Drake London, the rookie wide receiver there. Comes back to us in round nine. Now it's time for us to go ham at running back. We take Daryl Henderson. We take Naheem Hines. We end up at the next turn taking Albert O, which, you know, we really wanted to take Michael Carter at that point. I think it would have felt great if Michael Carter would have fallen to us. The one difficult part about implementing this strategy is we had another, the guy who picked before us, team eight, was a really sharp drafter. Team 12 was a really sharp drafter. We were on similar type guys and we were in between those two teams that made it difficult. Albert O is TE 13, was a little bit rich. I do like, though, taking a chance in the tight end premium format as he's he's one of a couple guys that I think does have the type of upside that you could get lucky on. If he's a full zero, I don't think it'll be a full zero, but it might be a full zero for our type of lineup. That's okay. We're going to live with it. Um, but but yeah, that, that was a tough turn as well. We get Jamal Williams coming back. Then we take one more wide receiver swing in round 13 at Wandell Robinson. We're done there. And then we're just peppering running back bets. Raheem Mostert and somewhat an uncertain backfield behind Chase Edmonds could be somewhat of a committee with a lot of rushing and a lot of efficiency there. We take a couple of pure dart throws. Deonta Foreman as the handcuff in that offense. We take Ronald Jones, whose stock has fallen so low given the Isaiah Pacheco hype. That actually, you know, he's someone I've been below ADP on. All off season, I think he was worth taking. And then Chris Evans, Tyler Beatty, just taking some chances there. The one thing that was tough about this draft was we missed out on the really high upside running back options. And this is something I have to be aware of and prioritize maybe earlier in drafts. So I think we got Daryl Henderson, Naheem Hines, who are a good mix of startability with a, with a touch of upside, maybe not huge upside, but a touch. Jamal Williams is basically a poor man's version of that exact profile. But we missed out on some of the guys I really like. Kenneth Walker went in round nine. Rashad White, we got sniped on the pick before us. Again, that team, that team, uh, uh, he went in round nine right before we took Daryl Henderson from that, that, uh, uh, team eight, who was really sniping us left and right. Isaiah Spiller and Kenneth Gainwell went after we took Henderson and Hines. Was really hoping that one of Spiller, Gainwell, Brian Robinson, or Michael Carter made it back to us. They didn't. 
this is where you could make the argument that instead of taking Drake London, we could have started running back one pick earlier. And instead of having Drake London, we could have had someone like Garrett Wilson went super late. Rondell Moore went in round 11. So we could have still taken a six wide receiver with a breakout profile. Traylon Burks went in round 10. We could have swapped it if we started with the upside in round eight earlier. Uh, so I do think, I, I really like the London pick, but I'm okay though if you would have said, okay, let's take Kenneth Walker here and get that type of profile in our lineup. And then we flip that. And instead of you know taking Naheem Hines in 10, we grab Garrett Wilson or Burks or Rondell Moore, that type of thing. So that's our draft. That's kind of how it played out. I am going to piggyback this episode with another solo podcast, looking at the types of running backs that I want to target late in drafts, particularly if you are doing a wide receiver heavy, zero RB build, hero RB build, whatever you want to call it. I did a thread on Twitter. You can follow me at two hats, one mic, looking at Kenneth Walker, Rashad White, Isaiah Spiller, and Kenny Gainwell in that thread, but I'll expand upon that again in this episode where I look at late round running back targets. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. Make sure you follow all my work over at Established to Run. Our draft kit is a phenomenal value. Also, please go to the YouTube channel, like, subscribe to the Established to Run channel. Helps me to continue to do content like this for free. Thanks, everybody. Best of luck this season.